Welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. Uh, my guest this week is James Esses. He was a criminal lawyer, and it's a bit hard to describe exactly how his path is and in, uh, in, where his path has taken him. And we'll we'll get into that. But he was a criminal lawyer before he chose to change careers and start studying to be a therapist. And then lots of uh, events ensued. ensued. Uh, but he is the founder of Thoughtful Therapists. Uh, and he has his own Substack, so you can find his writing there. You can find him on Twitter. Um, James, welcome to High Noon. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to chatting. So uh, the reason that it's a little bit hard to describe um, your bio in a couple sentences is not only because you made the unusual choice to begin with uh, to switch from a career in law to a career in therapy, um, but then you went to school um, to to study for that new career and uh you, you were unceremoniously, I, I guess I'll, I'll spoil the ending. You you were expelled via email. Um, do, you, do you want to start out by telling people why that happened or how that happened? Yeah, no no problem. I'll try and give the abridged version and then we can we can drill down into it if we need to. But uh, yeah, so I, I've been practicing as a lawyer for a number of years, but it wasn't quite doing it for, for me. It wasn't quite fulfilling in the way that I thought it might be. And I, I've been volunteering as a counsellor at, at a children's charity for a number of years in the UK and I thought this is what I want to spend the rest of my life doing so that's why I started studying part-time towards a, a master's degree in psychotherapy. At the time of my expulsion I was just finishing my third year um, of a five-year degree and I was just about to set up my own private practice and start seeing paying clients privately which is all very exciting. Um, while this had been going on, I was becoming more and more concerned about the, the political and also the medical landscape in terms of children struggling with their gender identity and suffering from gender dysphoria. I was particularly concerned with the push in the therapeutic world towards affirmation, so affirming, transitioning, medical transitioning. Uh, and I was speaking to detransitioners, you know, young women in particular who have suffered ir irreversible um, mental and physical harm because of puberty blockers, cross sex hormones and sex reassignment surgery. And I thought I need to speak out about this, you know, ethically as a therapist, because we need to ensure that there's explorative therapy open to these young people. And there's been bans around the world, I think, including in some, state, uh, some states in the United States around banning conversion therapy, as it's termed. Um, but there's a real fear that this will end up criminalising ethical, explorative therapy for children. So I spoke out about this. I launched a petition to the UK government asking them to safeguard therapy for children. Uh, and basically off the back of that, yes, one day I received an email from my university course provider telling me that I was expelled with immediate effect. Um, and within a mere matter of minutes, they had blocked me from my university email address, my university portal, and then to put the boot in, they went onto Twitter the same evening and publicized the expulsion. Uh, what was the reason that the university gave, um, either in public or to you in private, about, I mean, what rule can you possibly have violated uh, that would result in, in such a, like, um, first of all, expulsion at all, and second of all, um, you know, with with no sort of chance to appeal, you said they shut down your accounts immediately afterwards. I mean, what what explanation did they give, if any, for those actions? Well, the difficulty is I've never actually had a conversation with anyone at the university. Um, and if they're going to take disciplinary action, there's various layers that you need to go through, various hearings, you know, opportunities to put forward your side of the story, appeals. I, I wasn't offered any of that. What, what I received was a, a two paragraph email stating that there had been some complaints made about me and what I'd been saying in this space and that I brought them into disrepute and, and that was it. I, I, I never was signposted towards any policies. I was never provided with any evidence of what I had done wrong. Eventually when I got hold of the policies myself I went through to see well you know what would be the circumstances in which immediate expulsion without appeal uh, would be uh, an appropriate resolution and the types of offences in the university's handbook that this would be suitable for include physically assaulting or sexually assaulting another student on campus or defrauding the university. So they seem to be suggesting that me speaking out about my concerns about medicalizing children is some sort of equivalent to that. Um, I mean, that's that's obviously, I mean, we've talked a lot on this podcast, for example, with Aaron Sabarium about 
the institutional uh, sort of creep of not just gender ideology, but let's stick with gender ideology for now since it's most mm-hmm. relevant. Um, you know, the creep of these ideologies, not just into practitioners of um, whether that's, you know, psychology, psychi- uh, psychi- psychiatry, um, and or, or just the practice of medicine, uh, but into the institutions themselves. So into places like your university, into, um, you know, sort of board exam. I don't know exactly what the equivalent is in the UK, but but into um, organizations, professional organizations that uh, gatekeep with board exams, for example. Um, you know, is it is it your contention that let me ask you this, actually. Um, do you think that there are a bunch of other people who maybe share uh, in that profession, share some of your concerns, uh, but are afraid to face the same consequences from the institutions uh, that that you did? Or do you think this really is a kind of bottom up thing where the vast majority of people in this field, and we always hear about a consensus, right, that, that there is a bottom up consensus among, um, let's say, therapists in this case, on this issue, and that you were just very far outside of it? Uh, I think it's a combination. I, I, I would say that I've been contacted by many therapists, including long-standing therapists in the UK who have said they share my concerns but are too afraid to speak out. I've been contacted by trainee therapists who fear that if they say something, they'll also be chucked off their course. Um, and I know that there's some trainee therapists who have actually postponed their course waiting for the outcome of my legal case, which I'm sure we can talk about a bit later. But, but even in my own co- cohort, on my own course, I, I had peers who agreed with me on these topics, but just didn't feel able to, to speak out openly and say so. So um, I think there is a real fear that's put into people that if they step out of line at all, they'll be given the boot. But uh, I also think that these organisations tend to model what we're seeing in society more generally. I mean, we've seen a real push amongst commercial entities, amongst media organisations, political parties to embrace gender ideology, hook, line and sinker. Um, And we've seen this through subtle changes over a long period of time with language, etc. So I think there's a lot of people nowadays who aren't really that skilled up on exactly what all of these things mean, but they want to demonstrate that they're a nice person, they don't want to offend people unnecessarily, and so they go along with this, not realising the ramifications. Um, so let's talk about your legal case. So you are suing the university. Um, on on what grounds are you suing them? Is it a lack of due process that you were given? Um, what 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 is the sort of basis of your lawsuit? So I'm, I'm suing them. I'm also suing the kind of governing therapeutic body uh, in the UK. Called, they're called the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy because it, it appears from limited information I've received that they may have had some hand in what happened to me. So I'm, I'm taking them both to court um, on the basis of discrimination, and that is discrimination against my beliefs. And those are my beliefs around sex and gender. And I'm gender critical, as it's often termed nowadays, and, and also my beliefs around proper medical treatment for children. Um, and there's been a few cases in the United Kingdom in the run up to this, um, which have basically set in law that gender critical beliefs are protected under the UK's equality legislation. So that's what I'm going to be relying upon. Um, yeah, that's interesting because in the US, of course, um, we're seeing something similar where uh, people are starting to launch lawsuits under the Civil Rights Act, but not on the basis of belief because there is no equivalent statute. Um, there, there's the First Amendment, but that applies only in a government or a government connected institution. Um, but I mean, so so why why did you decide at, at the end of the day um, to to start this petition um, to speak out in such a public way? Uh, as you said, there were other people in your cohort who probably shared some of your concerns. Maybe they shared them with you privately. So why um, you know did you anticipate the level of blowback that you would get? Um, and what did what do you think now about sort of the institutional framework of the field, given that this kind of debate, which let's uh, you know frame it by saying that your beliefs are very, very firmly actually in the vast majority, at least in all the polls that I've seen of the US and of the UK. Um, so 
what what does it mean? First of all, why did you decide to speak out this way? And what does it mean that you are treated this way for holding beliefs that are, in fact, the dominant beliefs in, in society, but the minority beliefs only within this institution? Yeah. Well, as I said, I, I kind of immersed myself in the research, the studies that were going on around gender dysphoria. I, I was speaking as part of my volunteering counselling with young children who were saying that they felt they were trapped in the wrong bodies. I was looking at the potentially irreversible damaging impact of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and double mastectomies and all the rest of it. Um, and I was looking at the data around the kind of significant increase in the number of young people presenting with gender dysphoria, particularly adolescent girls, which was quite different to what we had seen previously. And I, you know, I thought from a therapeutic point of view, what are we doing here exactly? And I always return back to the basic idea that gender dysphoria is a mental health condition. And so as a therapist, our duty is to treat it in the same way as we would any other mental health condition, which is listening, exploration, empathy, considering contri contributing factors, considering different options that a young person can go down. But the message I was receiving time and time again, as I said, from the media, from politicians, from the therapeutic bodies was you should be affirming this. You know, you, you shouldn't be pathologizing being trans is what I've often been told. But I, I've thought that's fundamentally inconsistent because we've been told don't pathologize being trans. But at the same time, you must make available irreversible medication and surgery to treat it. Um, in my mind, you can't have both those things operating at the same time. But my, my primary concern is always being about children. There's other issues that we could speak about in relation to this gender debate, whether it's women's spaces and women's rights, whether it's free speech whether it's impact on sporting fairness, et cetera. But for me, it's always been around children's well-being because I, uh, I appreciate how vulnerable children are, you know, particularly at that age. I think back to my own childhood, children can become convinced of very many things and be certain about very many things that only later in life do they realise actually they got it wrong because they haven't had the time to explore and to develop and grow. But I feel that we've robbed children of that opportunity to grow and make mistakes and then move on with their lives without regret because we're forcing them into taking potentially irreversible decisions at such a young age. Yeah, it, it really seems like this is um, this phenomenon is focused among young girls. If you look at the numbers, um, there, there has been a much smaller in increase in um, male to female transitioners uh, and a much larger increase in essentially uh, preteen to teenage girls transitioning. Um, you know what what are some of the things you observed in working with these kids um like what other features characterize other than being female and and either preteen or teen i mean what sort of things um and without being specific obviously about any individual person but what sort of patterns did you uh see repeatedly among some of these kids that were questioning whether or not their biological sex was in fact for them uh quite often deeply unhappy with themselves, almost to the point of self-loathing and a real disease in themselves and in the world around them. Uh, and I think gender ideology and transitioning was kind of sold to them as a bit of a silver bullet for that. But I would, off as I said, I mean, I would do what I would do with speaking with any other person for any other issue, which was just around explore exploration. And, and that, that included getting them to visualize, okay, so let's imagine you have this medication and surgery. Would that be it? Do you think you'd just be happy with yourself and be content in the world and, and, and just love yourself for who you are at that point? And quite often they would come back to me on reflection and say, well, actually, no, I wouldn't because there's other things about myself I also don't like, other parts of my body, other ways of my being that I don't like that I would also want to change. And that would begin to get the cogs turning to the point that they would realize that this wasn't a, a, a fix all solution. And that even if they transitioned, they would still have many things they hated and disliked about themselves. And actually, would it get them any further on in this journey towards liking who they are? Um, so often in life, it is about acceptance because it's in so many ways, it is luck of the draw, you know, the circumstances and the bodies in which we're born. But constantly selling this myth that you can be forever happy by, you know, modifying mutilating your own body uh, i think is really quite dangerous um and then also from other conversations i've had plus again looking at the research 
there's a lot of comorbidities with gender dysphoria, whether it's uh, previous traumatic experiences, you know, intense bullying, um, autism spectrum disorder as well. There's a huge correlation between that. Uh, and, and even internalized homophobia. And again, a significant proportion of individuals with gender dysphoria end up coming out as gay. And that's why there's this concern, particularly in the United Kingdom at the moment, that um, by allowing affirmation only therapy for someone to transition, it's basically a form of gay conversion therapy. And that th these young children, if they were just left to be, they would come out as gay in due course. And that would be what helps them to resolve this kind of inner conflict that they've got going on. Yeah, famously, for example, in Iran, if you are homosexual, uh, they the, the state will encourage and pay for your sex transition. It's illegal to be homosexual, but not to transition to the opposite sex. Um, I guess here, here's here's maybe where um, I start to depart from the entire. Uh, I don't know. I, I will confess to being deeply skeptical of of sort of. Um, psychotherapy or, or therapy generally, obviously there, there are people who are helped by it. Um, but it, the word you used before was pathologizing, right? Um, to some extent, I, I think this is an extension of, of other ways in which we pathologize normal, like human emotions or, or states of being, um, as, as mental, like as mental illnesses to treat, uh, versus, and, and I, I'm not at all. I'm like, it's funny. Cause I've come out in a similar position and there are definitely people, for example, who, who want to quote unquote, normalize, uh, mental illness and want to take away the, the stigma instead of, um, but it's, it's almost the opposite. I wonder if aside from some of the more obvious cases of, of mental illness, um, we pathologize human suffering to the point where, um, we treat, for example, uh, some of these, these feelings of like discomfort, for example, with, with our bodies, with life, with, um, you know, these, these used to be questions, for example, that religions, uh, would try to answer that th there were other answers. Obviously, um, stoicism was an answer, uh, for a long time for people asking these kinds of questions, like, who am I, what happens after we die? Um, you know, and things that cause, enormous amount of anxiety and, and suffering to us. And I worry that we have medicalized asking those questions and, and searching for answers in that, in a way that is ultimately unhelpful in the same way that it's unhelpful to provide a medical answer to somebody who says that their body doesn't fit them. Um, I wonder if it's also unhealthy to provide a medical answer to uh, somebody who comes and says like, I don't feel you know, I, I'm, I'm racked with anxiety, for example, because um, I, I think about or I, I think about all the time the fact that, you know, the human condition comes to an end and we don't know what happens after that. Right. Like, I, I think this is sort of, these are sort of natural reactions to being human uh, that often get categorized into something that's pathological rather than something that's normal. And then on the flip side, we, we are at least in America. Uh, we have this enormous industry around, um, I would say primarily a handful of, of conditions, gender dysphoria being one of them, but um, anxiety, depression, there's an enormous amount of, of sort of funding and, and um, uh, organizations, NGOs, stuff like that around those conditions. And at the same time, we are allowing people who obviously have like, for example, serious schizophrenia or some people, conditions that are totally, they're, they're out of touch with reality half the time of what's going on around them. We allow people as a lifestyle choice to live on the street instead of committing them, which we would have done 30 or 40 years ago. So um, I know there's a lot that I just threw at you there, but, um, you know, I, I, I guess I'll distill it down to a couple of things. One, what do you think about, do you think there's the possibility that we are medicalizing other natural parts, just like growing up, you know, feeling out of, uh, um, you know, disliking your body or feeling out of step with your body is probably a natural part of, of growing up for most people and, and people get over it. Um, you know, are we, are we pathologizing other aspects of what it is to be human, uh, into something that requires a treatment? Hmm. Uh, I, it, it may come as a surprise to you, given the field I wanted to enter into, but I actually agree with you completely on what you just said. Um, and I think as a society and as healthcare professionals, we've prioritized 
comfort and happiness those seem to be the things that we must aim for at all times um, and anything which puts somebody outside of their comfort zone um, is unacceptable which is why in universities now we're seeing this cancel culture and these trigger warnings and all the rest of it because we don't think children and young people should be able to have to deal with forms of distress or discomfort and then happiness at all times if, if, if someone says or does something that makes somebody unhappy then that cannot be a good thing that's not life uh, I, I tend to be more philosophical about this myself uh, I think that life is probably majority struggle um, and it's about searching for the happiness where you can. But these are all normal emotions for human beings to have. And actually, if somebody offered me the opportunity myself to live a forever happy life, and that's the sole emotion I felt, I would say no to that, because that wouldn't be real, genuine, congruent humanity. Um, I think it's important that we feel all types of emotion. And that tells us that we're truly living. And that includes anxiety and stress. And unhappiness and sorrow and all the rest of it so i mean in my own work when i was practicing it was often about getting people to a place of acceptance actually and whether that's through empath empathetic listening or whether it's through philosophical dis discussion i think it's often about acceptance rather than trying to force changes um and i agree with you generally around this kind of pathologization of completely normal types of behavior you know bringing it back to the gender issue it felt as if for a while we were moving away from gender stereotypes um, and telling people that there's nothing wrong with being a more masculine girl or a more feminine boy. You know, people should be able to dress how they want and speak how they want and have whatever hobbies they want. But the types of particularly educational materials for young school kids I'm coming across nowadays, very, very concerning. I've read children's books in which it's been suggested to young boys this if they like flowers and the color pink that they might actually be trapped in the wrong body i mean that is the very definition of pathologizing completely normal behavior and regressing back to really quite harmful and dangerous stereotypes why why are we so fragile then um what has changed in our society because you know part of this is you always hear the the kids are are uh the kids don't do their chores, the kids are overly sensitive, the kids are right. So there, there's a generational component to this. But at the same time, it does actually truly, I'm actually not in the camp anymore. I used to very, very much uh, make fun of the woke, right? Uh, to try to, um, you know, whatever. I, I just, I thought a large part of it is fake. Um, and, and I think for some older people, it is. It is virtue signaling, it's fake. Um, but the more that I interacted with uh, some or, or, or watch videos of some of these like kind of easily mockable, super, super woke young people, it, it seemed like it was reflecting some kind of genuine fragility, like mental fragility. Um, why, why, has, why is it that our society seems, it seems like there are a lot more people today who have that sort of mentally fragile posture, um, even a genuine one uh than than there were even let's say um 20 30 years ago well i think there's quite a few contributing factors i mean i i read the coddling of the american mind which i found particularly interesting um and i've listened to other speakers on this topic and i think it can range from even the fact that although often in many countries the streets are never safer than they've been um children are spending more and more time sheltered and indoors and actually in certain surveys um parents disproportionately feel that there's a risk to their children when in reality actually they're much safer than they would think so children are being kind of more coddled in the home and then as soon as they're into the educational sphere again there's certain texts that are now being banned from schools and universities for fear of causing offense children can you know and then university students can opt out of certain lectures um, that might cause them some sort of distress if I bring it back to a kind of therapeutic model around avoidant tendencies, um, if somebody has a disposition towards wanting to avoid something, if it causes them stress or anxiety, the way to treat that is with gentle but consistent exposure. Um, you know, it's termed exposure therapy. Um, the answer is not to continue to avoid it, because the more you avoid it, the bigger a deal it's going to become inside your own head. So with some, you know, for somebody with agoraphobia who's too scared to go outside, the answer is not to stay holed up inside the house all the time, because they'll become so sensitized to that, that even the mere act of opening the front door 
and not even stepping outside could be highly debilitating for them. So it's about exposing people and testing their boundaries a bit and you know helping them to become comfortable. Whereas this kind of all or nothing in or out approach for young people, which is if something causes you distress, you can just bow out and not have to confront this, I think is really quite worrying. Um, on the fragility point, I, I I do slightly agree with you, but I also think that um, some of it some of it comes from a place of the fact that it pays these days to be a victim. I mean, we we have a lot of identity victimhood type politics at the moment. Uh, certain groups of people are being pitted against one another to show that they're the, the most vulnerable and the most victimized. And a lot of these young people, they will, you know, that they will present as quite fragile. I think when it suits them, but they can also be bloody tough to the point of almost being ruthless. I mean, I, I watched a video from a few days ago in which the Minister for Education in the United Kingdom was visiting a university campus, and he ended up having to be ushered out um, by security guards because of a, a mound of aggressive, protesting, trans-supporting students who were following him around, getting in his face and screaming conservative scum in his face. And those were not individuals to me who were afraid or fearful or fragile. There was a real anger and confidence and power in their eyes. So I think so often these days, it pays to be a victim, you know, in certain circumstances. And otherwise, a lot of people and a lot of university students feel that they can treat anyone else with as much disrespect and anger as they say, see so fit. You, you don't think that those are connected in some way or so I've had Mary Eberstadt on this show and, and her uh, book and her general thesis of which she's kind of written several books around that at the similar topic um, is that we simply don't have the bases of identity that we used to and and more or less that this is a problem of modernity right that um, there are many fewer people who are attached to a, not a religion and correspondingly a church community um, or religious community and at the same time our family structure, has not only become more unstable, it's become uh, it's much smaller, right? So her thesis has been, we learn by mimicking and we also have answered these questions of who am I, you know, what's my role in the world um, through essentially institutions of religion and family, both of which have either dropped away or become much, much weaker. And that without those structures, we do one of, of a couple different directions sometimes at the same time. One is to become more fragile and to really to feel all the time like we are on the edge of, of mentally shattering. Um, and, and the other one is uh, to embrace, a, I guess, a new form of religion or, or um, something that makes you feel righteous, that gives you a place, um, a structure, a community. So to me, I guess I don't I don't see those two things as as. Um, necessarily at odds with each other it, it makes sense to me that somebody who is so fragile as to cannot hear uh, a word of criticism of um or or even questioning of for example gender ideology uh at the same time um you know makes it essentially goes about making a world in which he or she doesn't have to hear that ever you know it, it's it's as though we we hand the uh, the agoraphobe right um the, the keys to shut down the entire world around them, right? Rather than withdraw into the house, they just have to, you know, we, we handed them the keys to say like, whatever makes me anxious, I'm going to, you know, shut down entirely. Um, and so I guess it, it, I don't know, those don't seem as contradictory to me as you seem to, um, as you, as you seem to think they are. Yeah, that, that's a fair point. I, I can see how they can kind of coexist together. I, I agree with you in particular around kind of disillusion of religion, you know, something's always going to come along and fill that void. And this kind of identity politics seems to be what's appeared. Um, I, I don't like using the term privilege because it's been kind of uh, taken over. But I, I would say also that it's a sign of how privileged we are generally in the Western world, that we can take offence at such things. We now equate words with literal violence. You know, that the, there was a period of time in which certain places were so dangerous that actually the fear of physical violence, gang culture, all the rest of it was front and centre of people's minds. Now we're being told that if you accidentally misgender someone, for example, that that is an act of literal violence against that individual. Um, 
I, I think for us to even be in a position of making those kind of arguments says a lot about what a privileged position we are overall. And certainly, you know, there's still countries that exist out there that still struggle with a lot more corruption and poverty and crime and all the rest of this. And gender ideology or indeed identity politics is not front and centre of their citizens' minds because they've got more important things than they need to worry about. For us in the Western world, things have never been better. I find this particularly interesting. We're constantly being told by the other side that things have never been worse. For example, there's a lot of trans activist groups in the United Kingdom who are going around saying that the UK government are basically enabling the torture of trans people and that we live in a kind of institutionally transphobic society and that things have never been worse. Well, actually, if you look back over the timeline of history, truthfully and objectively, things have never been better and we have never been more tolerant and we've never been more equal. So this narrative, I think, is really quite worrying. Yeah. Um, why do you think why do you think the West has this sort of self-flagellating instinct? Right. And and it seems actually uh, I was thinking about this recently, um, watching Douglas Murray give a talk about his book. Um, and he really he kind of locates the source of wokeness in the United States, which I, I think is accurate. Um, I, I, unfortunately and, and ashamedly, I think our major export is now wokeness and woke ideology. Um, and, and America has an enormous cultural power, right? Before we were exporting Hollywood movies <laughs> and now we're exporting or exporting culturally, our cultural export is wokeness. But um, there does seem to be an embrace of these ideas in the former Anglosphere more than say in France um, or, or Germany uh, and certainly not even getting to the, the um, non-Western countries, right? Uh, but even within the West, there seems to be a divide uh, where the former Anglosphere countries are more susceptible to this kind of um, like extreme instinct of self-hatred or flagellation, mm -hmm. or flagellation of, of the society, right? Um, this extreme form of critique, self-critique. Um, I'm thinking now here about like the immigration debates in the UK in in the mid and late 2000s, um, and it, it like some some of the others. So some I, I had some example in Australia, but oh the the um, the thing that turned out to be false about uh, the the mass murder of Aboriginal children. Of course, the the mistreatment of of Native peoples in Australia very real, but like the the thing that everybody was freaking out about turned out to be vastly exaggerated. Um, do you think there's something about the former Anglosphere countries that is this sort of like a, um, a weaponized version of our, our tendency to sort of slow change and self critique over time. Like what, why is it that this seems so much more adopted and powerful in the U S the UK, New Zealand, um, Australia, right. Canada versus, I don't know, Germany or France. I mean, I think part of it is kind of culture specific. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting the point you make about America's place in the world. And I, I would agree, it does seem as if particularly the UK takes its lead from America in a lot of ways. But actually, in, in some ways, the UK is far worse. You know, one thing I've always noticed about Americans is still that sense of patriotism, actually. And even when I was in America myself um, a few weeks ago, you know, American flags flying high. And, and most people, obviously, there's still a group of people trying to do America down, but most people seem to be pretty proud and pretty patriotic to be American. I find that far less in the United Kingdom. And actually, there's a real sense of almost um, nervousness or embarrassment or even shame um, associated with patriotism. It was one of our general elections. I can't remember if it was the last general election or the one before, but um, a Labour Party politician ended up condemning on social media and mocking the fact that some individual was flying the English flag outside of his house. And she was clearly like sneering at it, kind of looking down on it, it almost as if this person was kind of scum for having done so. I mean, she attracted a hell of a lot of criticism for that. But the fact that a, 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 you know, a leading member of a political party would make that type of comment says a lot about the state of play in the United Kingdom. I think British people in particular um, are very good at this um, doing themselves down and you know at times extreme modesty to the point of um, you know, being self self-critical and self-deprecating 
Um, so I think sometimes it is kind of culture specific, but generally, I, d I don't know. I mean, I, it, it, it's an interesting question. Why is it in some countries and not others? You know, particularly yeah, if you look at Germany and, and their history. But I think one of the things I struggle with in this space more generally is the fact that at one point in history, all peoples, all nationalities, all religions have done bad things and have harmed or persecuted. I, I, I can't think of any part of the globe or any religious faith that hasn't done that in some way to one another. Um, and thankfully, much of that has stopped. And thankfully, you know, we, we cooperate with people who are very different to us and different religions, and different nationalities and ethnicities. And, you know, by and large, I think people get along these days, which is quite a good thing. But I don't think anyone could be free of the accusation of their ancestors having done at some point in the past something wrong. Um, I don't know why we don't just accept that and acknowledge we live in different times now, thankfully, and put that down to history and experience and something that has taught us and that we've learned from, as opposed to what's happening nowadays, which is this constant need almost to kind of rewrite history. Um, and we're seeing that in the United Kingdom again. You know, there's been a lot of um, tearing down of statues of individuals whose family may have had some connection with the slave trade, however long ago. Um, and again, you know, what, what, what type of message is this sending? You know, what, why are we trying to rewrite history? We can't rewrite it. It's what's taking place. As long as we learn and grow, grow from it, that's the most important thing. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, as I said, if you were to ask some people in the United Kingdom at the moment, they would tell you that the United Kingdom is you know, institutionally transphobic, homophobic, racist, and all the rest of this. And if you look at the real solid facts, if you look at the legislation that we've got in place, if you look at the crime rates, et cetera, it's just simply not the case. Um, yeah, that's interesting to, to hear a perspective on America. Of course, from my perspective, uh, we are very self-hating, um, but I take your point that actually, and this has always been weirdly a, a difference in America, like everybody likes to fly the flag here. Um, I, I, I Maybe in part because we don't have the the sort of 20th century history of nationalism here. Um, obviously we have our own, as you say, uh, every, every civilization has, has its own uh, kind of sins in the past, um, but the, the statue stuff we have here, right? Um, and we're not just tearing down the statues of the Confederacy in the South. We're also uh, tearing down statues of Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and and it worries me because, actually, it worries me more in America in a sense because we are, that's kind of all we have, right? In common is a common history, language, culture, um, to some extent that that's it. Uh, we're not a, a um, the UK is kind of a, at the end of the day, in the beginning was a series of tribes that sometimes happily, sometimes less happily, right. Um, that uh, combined into the, the United Kingdom, right. Um, America, America has always been much more of a polyglot um, and, and much less, we have much less to rely on, for example, what the French have, right. Which is this this perceived kinship, um, even after waves of immigration, and even after being relatively accepting of of new people into the political unit, there's still this sort of idea that they're one people. To that extent, the U.S. has never been that, um, which I think has been a great advantage of ours in some ways. But in others, if we get rid of our civic religion and if we stop flying the flag, we don't have anything else in common. I worry about versus. And, but maybe you feel that way about the UK as well. Well, I think there is a real risk. If, if people go from having pride of their history and pride of their country towards dismissing and doing down and even on some level hating their country for kind of perceived injustices that have taken place in the past, I think that's quite dangerous because that opens up the avenues towards you know, real antisocial behaviour. You know, if somebody has real pride in their country, um, there's only so far they're going to go. But you know, when I was watching, for example, a lot of the rioting, um, a lot of the Black Lives Matter rioting that took place, particularly in the states, but you know, it did spill over into the United Kingdom, particularly in the states. I was looking at th those groups of people, and I was thinking, you know, that those are people that clearly do not have any pride in their country whatsoever. And I think that's misguided. And I mean, the, the the nature, the violent nature of those riots, um, you know, was, was horrific to watch. But 
I, th I think a country can only be done down so much until it becomes a place where people feel that they no longer need to obey the law, for example, and that they, they're entitled to do whatever they want because in their eyes they're writing some sort of historical abstract wrong. Um, so I think there is a real danger with that. I think in terms of the kind of cancel culture point more generally, I mean, you were talking about some of the statues that are now being taken down. I mean, it seems as if nobody's really um, uh, free from being cancelled. And I think this is the, the strange thing because perfection doesn't exist. And every single human being on earth at some point or, or another has done or said something that they probably shouldn't have, and that they possibly regress, and that possibly even hurt or offended somebody else. Um, if that is the bar for being cancelled, then the entire human race should be cancelling itself collectively because nobody is immune from this. You know, we are imperfect creatures. Um, and we see this more and more now, particularly going trawling back through somebody's social media history and picking out a comment that they made, you know, for example, 10, 20 years ago when they were a teenager. And now we're cancelling them in this day and age as if the person standing in front of, of, of us today is the exact same person that posted that tweet however many years ago. I think, it's, I think it's really ridiculous. And I think it's holding human beings to a standard that we can never, ever reach. I mean, maybe this is a thread uh, in all the, the discussions we've been having for the last 40 minutes. It, it, it's it's an, a vision of perfection that isn't attainable. Maybe it does go back to a conflict of vision, sort of a constrained view of what life, um, what humanity is actually capable of um, and what it can deliver and the pursuit of some kind of utopian ideal or whether that's within the self or society, right? Like the, that I'm going to feel perfectly empowered, happy, strong um, all the time, or that my society is going to be utopian and perfect and never mistreat anybody and nobody will be unfairly treated. I mean, these are in, in some sense, just one is the larger idea of the other, um, this this pursuit of perfection that really does seem to have a lot of negative consequences, not just the obvious historical parallels, but the, you know, even internally, even for a single person, the, the relentless pursuit of feeling happy or perfect all the time, I, I really think has had some enormous negative consequences, including when when you're a 13 year old girl um, and you you think that, well, you know, people seem on Instagram or on, you know, TikTok or whatever, they seem like they're perfectly happy all the time. I'm not. Therefore, there must be something wrong with me or my body or, I mean, it really does seem like it's the same impulses that when I was a kid and, you know, when I was in high school in, in the 2000s, right, it was um, cutting or uh, like, various sort of social pathologies the difference is you know most of those girls who scratched their wrists a few times with a piece of wire like went on to live normal lives i don't want to say happy lives because that kind of contradicts my point but normal human lives as adults um whereas if if, if you are sort of buoyed in your search for perfection by the medical institutions around you um then you do have, as you, as you say, and as Abigail Schreier has said, you know, irreversible consequences to your body. Um, let's 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 uh, wrap up with this. What 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 do you think? How do you think um, is there a path to change some of these institutions? Right, because uh, there are, there are serious consequences to, for example, the medical establishment going in this direction with gender ideology. I, I mean, I, I talk to parents all the time um, who are now concerned about taking their kids, not just to the therapist, to the pediatrician, um, because the pediatrician's office will ask them, are you a boy or a girl, right? And they feel that that's confusing, especially if they have a teenager who's going through this this period where um, this does seem like a a reasonable explanation for why <laughs> for why they, they feel not quite right. Um, and so is there is there a path uh, obviously you, you write about this, you've challenged folks to debate, um, you you have your lawsuit. I mean, is there a path to actually forcing these institutions back into neutrality of some kind, or does neutrality itself, is that an illusion? And there's always been normative judgments within these institutions and simply their normative judgments have replaced ours, if that makes sense. 
Mm. Well, I do believe that, I mean, in the UK, we've already started to see a bit of a shift. And the, and the fact that I even um, would categorise this as a shift is very telling. But for example, you know, when our Prime Minister Boris Johnson a few months ago now came out in public as part of a kind of just general interview and said that there are biological differences between men and women. And it actually, it, it had taken him many, many months to get to the point of being able to say that because he and his advisors clearly feared a kind of backlash that might happen if he said it. And this was kind of crowned as some sort of big achievement and big day. Now, I was appreciative that he said it, but the fact that the Prime Minister of our country is even called in for criticism for saying that biology and sex is real really is a sign of the times that we're living in. But these are all steps in the right direction towards kind of trying to reclaim evidence, scientific-based, you know, healthcare and, and a narrative that we've got in our country. But I think it's going to take a, it's going to take a bit longer. The therapeutic professions in the UK seem to have been particularly ideologically captured. That's partly emphasised by what's happened to me. But even yesterday, I mean, I wrote an article about this, but um, one of the leading therapeutic bodies in the UK published an article by an academic yesterday uh, and this academic suggests that believing in biology is transphobic which is quite a concerning thing to see in an article that's meant to be talking about uh, an academic research study that he engaged in um, and, and the author of this um, article also has previously said on social media that he believes that being right wing is fundamentally incompatible with even being a therapist so in, in his in his eyes there's something kind of gravely wrong about being right leaning and that that should prohibit you from even engaging in counseling or therapy in the first place um so this kind of narrative is doing the rounds in our um, therapeutic bodies so i think that's going to take a lot longer to sort out also commercial entities i'm particularly worried about i, I went to a I went to a talk given by a kind of trans activist organization quite recently kind of pushing gender ideology and they were telling their supporters that even if the politicians don't go our way and even if the media doesn't go our way actually the crucial thing that gives me hope is that all of the companies are going our way because they are the ones who kind of set the tone for how society works generally and we're seeing this time and time again through a lot of major major corporations engage, engaging in virtue signaling and all the rest of this. And I fear that even if our politicians see sense, actually these commercial entities might pave the way for things going forward. Um, but, but overall, there are there are some good points. There have been some successful legal challenges in the United Kingdom. The media is now more willing to cover this in a more balanced way. And as I've said, there's been some political changes too. So I, I think the tide is beginning to turn, but it's going to require a lot more people to speak out and stand up. And I appreciate how difficult it is because people have a genuine fear that they are going to get cancelled or attacked or have the reputation slandered and that is a real possibility and I always tell people that they need to prepare themselves in case that happens but I want to get to the point of helping people to feel empowered to speak out anyway because there's a hell of a lot of us out there as you've said this idea of being gender critical is probably the majority view um, so we just need to help people to feel comfortable and to know that if they do speak out and even if they get cancelled they will still have support around them I mean you know my, my entire life's future has kind of gone up in the air. But thanks to the generosity of thousands of complete strangers, I've been able to crowdfund this litigation and take my university to court. So there is a hell of a lot of support out there. I think America is going to take a bit more time on this. Um, I, I do worry about that. Um, hopefully, if we can get things sorted in the United Kingdom, then maybe we can focus our attention towards the States. But it, it feels so deeply embedded this kind of identity politics in what's going on over there that I, I I do worry I do worry it will certainly be very interesting to see what happens the next time uh, your presidential election comes around um, I think that will say a lot about the tone and the mood of, of the country yeah I guess um I'm one step more cyn I guess both one step more optimistic and one step more cynical in the sense that I I think I'm I'm more certain than I've ever have been that in fact uh, there, there is a strong majority for at least some of the basic propositions uh, that are unsayable in our institutions. Um, I'm less certain than ever that those institutions will allow democratic power to work, and by which I don't mean that ballot boxes are going to get stuffed. I, I, I mean the kind of things that happened under the Trump presidency, where 
the the bureaucracy essentially functioned without the president and around the president's wishes that what you what you noted the the sort of the corporate world um, has an enormous amount of power and they can independently take action um it, it seems like the power of, of democracy is quite cabined and is is more cabined every day in particular with regard to these kinds of questions um, whether that's gender ideology or some other aspect of of the narrative the woke narrative that has been as you say so deeply embedded in our our institutions it's funny i, I think Americans are some of the the least, I think, captured in many ways in terms of the population. Uh, there's there's many many millions and millions of people in America who don't know even that a lot of us exists. Although I think that's a smaller and smaller percentage of people, but it really has completely taken an iron grip over virtually every institution that has any relationship to power, whether it's public or private. Um, it's 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 a really interesting dynamic. As a as a conservative, it's been you know, um, it's been interesting to suddenly find, uh, for example, some of, of my Marxist friends more more uh, convincing, not with regard to economics, but um, with regard to class structure. It suddenly seems a lot of their critiques seem more reasonable to me than they than they once did. Um, well, this is it. I mean, when I, as I said, when I was in the states a few weeks ago, something that particularly concerned me, and I found very very odd, and says a lot about. The changing nature of the culture in the states is that I, I went to the civil rights museum in atlanta georgia you know which is basically there to talk about the black civil rights movement and it focuses particularly on martin luther king but you know other main players in that game um you know it's a great fascinating museum about that struggle and then i went to the gift shop when i was leaving and on the shelf was a book about gender ideology aimed at school children um which it was like a little coloring book and it said to children your doctor made a guess at who you were when you were born and they might have made a mistake. Um, now we could we could spend ages unpicking how bad that word is and how dangerous it is, but I found it very bizarre that that book was in the gift shop of that particular museum. You know, it, de you know, it, irrelevant, uh, 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 you know, at, at least completely and utterly irrelevant. And yes, it's there. So it, that tells me that actually these things are all being joined together and you know, I can imagine someone saying, well, if you're against that book being in that gift shop, then you must also be against the black civil rights movement. And then it goes on from there. These things are all being joined up together. And it's kind of a pissing of you're either with us or you're against us. And I, that, that really does worry me. So I think, yeah, for the States, um, there's been such an enmeshment of these ideologies into kind of daily life. Well, uh, we'll see. We'll see whether we can save America. But um, but thank you, James, so much for for coming on High Noon. Uh, where where can people find more of your writing, and where can they follow the the outcome of your lawsuit? Um, and where can they help crowdfund it? Hmm. Uh, Twitter. I'm I'm pretty active on Twitter. You can just type my name into Google, and you'll find it. I've, I've got a Substack that I write on. And then equally, if you type in James S's crowdfund into Google, it will take you to my crowd justice page. Um, and you can donate there if you so wish. And then I post all of the updates about the case there as well. I've got a preliminary hearing in less than two weeks and hopefully then the trial date will be set thereafter. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very appreciative for the support that people have given me. And I, I'm also happy for people to reach out to me and share their stories with me on an individual basis. I think it's important for me to hear that actually and to ensure that I'm giving voice to other people's voices that aren't necessarily being given airtime. Um, but yeah, I mean, to anyone watching who supported my case, you know, thank you. And I, I couldn't have done it without you. Well, thank you very much for coming on. And thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Setman is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to Inez.Setman at IWF.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or IWF.org. Be brave and we'll see you next time on High Noon.